there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. Time to return to our exploration of all things dragons. Today, thanks to viewer feedback, we're talking about hatchlings, wormlings, baby dragons, all things to do with them. I find it remarkable that this has not been thoroughly covered in a supplement for 5th edition officially, as it's one of the main ways that players will interact with dragons, as the Dungeon Master really, really needs a lot of information to do this right. So settle back, grab a snack and a beverage, because we're going to get deeply nerdy. So you just gave your player character a dragon egg. First of all, they did not just find a viable dragon egg at random, because you can nip that in the bud with the following sets of four words, which are, this one is infertile, it's cold and dead, this one's a dud. It is still highly valuable for alchemical purposes, ritual ingredients, every part of a dragon is sought after. Eggs are a rare find on the magical creature black market, and Arms and Equipment Guide states that the entry level price for a live dragon egg is no less than 10,000 gold pieces, often much more depending on the breed of the dragon, and knowing that the breed of the dragon is essential to successfully incubating the egg up to the point that it hatches, because each type of dragon has a different requirement. It's large part due to the elemental nature of draconic metabolism. A dead dragon egg, or an egg that has never been fertilised, is still worth at least a thousand gold to the right buyer, I should think. But let's concentrate on live dragon eggs. Here we turn to the greatest source, uh, resource of dragon lore in the multiverse, the Dragonomicon written by Andy Collins, Skip Williams, and James Wyatt, which are also the three most unlikely names for dragon scholars in the multiverse. But anyway, we can turn to this book and find exactly how each of the main species of dragon eggs lays eggs, uh, how long they take to incubate, what size the eggs are, and what conditions are required during incubation. White dragons have the fastest gap in between egg laying cycles at only 105 days. This doesn't mean that they have to lay eggs at that point. It just indicates the minimum minimum time between laying the, um, the between laying eggs and being able to do so again. And there is a margin of error of plus or minus 10 days for all of these. Uh, black, green, and brass dragons require 120 days. Coppers 135. Blue and bronze need 150 days. Red and silver 165 days. And gold dragons need a minimum of 180 days. Or 170 or 190 with that plus or minus 10 days. When they do lay eggs, it will be a clutch of two to five eggs. And under normal circumstances, they will uh, do this at most only once a year. Male dragons can fertilize eggs from a young adult stage all the way up to worm stage. And female dragons uh, begin laying at the young adult age and remain fertile up to the very old age. Incubation times vary. White dragons, 420 days. Black, green and brass dragons, 480 days. Copper, 540 days. Blue and bronze, 600 days. Red and silver, 660 days. And gold dragons take 720 days. That's well over a couple of years. Dragon eggs are ma uh, measured by their length, and each has a diameter of half the total length, being more of a rounded oblong. Black, brass, copper, and white dragon eggs are one foot long and weigh one pound. They have an armor class of 12 and 10 hit points. Blue, bronze, green, and silver dragon eggs are two feet long and weigh eight pounds. They have an armor class of 13 and 15 hit points. Red and gold dragon eggs are four feet long, weigh 60 pounds, and have an armor class of 15 and 20 hit points. Incubation is far more complicated than you might have thought. For black dragons, the egg has to be immersed in acid potent enough to do at least 1d4 damage per round of exposure to it, or the egg must be completely sunk in a peat bog, flooded swamp, or marsh. Transporting the egg will entail also transporting the, the surrounding bath of acid, or a heavy trunk full of stinking mud. For blue dragon eggs, they need to have the temperature that they are exposed to dramatically altered halfway through each day. First at between 32 and 48 degrees Celsius, or between 90 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot, but survivable. And then the second half of the day, the temperature must plunge to between 4 and 15 degrees Celsius, cool, or between 40 and 60 Fahrenheit. And this is the, the sort of extreme temperatures found in deserts. Red uh, brass and gold dragon eggs are fairly easy to incubate. You just sit them in an open flame. As long as the temperature does not drop below 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit, they will be okay. But you've got to maintain that flame for 720 days for a gold dragon egg. 
The bronze dragon egg must be immersed in a sea or ocean or someplace where tide waters flow over at least twice a day. Mixing just salt and water will not work unless it's natural sea salt or the salt taken directly from the elemental plane of earth or water. Copper dragon eggs must be either immersed in acid the same way black dragon eggs are or kept packed inside cool clay or sand and kept in uh, as close to between 4 and 5, 15 degrees Celsius or between 40 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit as possible. So cold, like a cold day. Some sort of Same sort of thing with the green dragon eggs, acid will normally do, or they must be kept buried in a pile of rotten leaves, kept damp with rainwater. Both silver and white dragon eggs must be buried in snow, encased in ice, or kept in a temperature below 18 degrees Celsius or 0 degrees Fahrenheit. When they hatch, most wormlings take around two minutes to get free of the shell once they manage to break out, uh, break it from the inside. All of the eggs in the clutch hatch at the same time. This is a thing common to all draconic species. Opening an egg before the quarter, uh, the last qu final quarter of the incubation period causes the wormling inside to die. If the egg is opened during the final quarter of the incubation period, the wormling can uh, make a check to survive, but if successful, it takes non-lethal damage equal to its current hit points, and that damage cannot be healed until the wormling's normal incubation period passes, and the wormling will suffer a level of exhaustion for that entire time, so they're very, very sickly. Dragon hatchlings are only helpless for a few moments immediately after freeing themselves from the shell. They take in their surroundings with senses already sharp enough for hunting, experiencing a flood of recognition as instinctual memories suddenly start to make a whole lot more sense in relation to, to, to their new environment. Most hatchlings can talk almost as soon as they hatch, and this is not baby talk, this is fluent draconic, and they are very swift at picking up common and other languages that, that they're exposed to. If there is any being around them that can speak draconic, they will naturally gravitate towards speaking with that being, asking them questions about everything. At this age, they're very open to being influenced, however, they have finely tuned survival instincts very finely tuned and here we need to talk about individual kinds of dragon wormlings and just what they're capable of so we'll talk about that in a moment. As of 5th edition, dragon age categories have been made universal so all the dragon breeds remained as wormlings for the first five years of life or less. And there is a very interesting part, that or less statement. So what causes baby dragons to grow faster or slower? Your first clue is that there is a dramatic size difference between the egg that they hatch from and the actual medium size category of a wormling. And this is where the magical elemental nature of draconic life uh, as a life form becomes dramatically obvious and brings the whole lot of other important aspects of dracon draconic metabolism into uh, and their drives into focus. Precious metals are usually the bulk of what constitutes a dragon's hoard, and it's this huge pile of precious metals and gems in which they snuggle down to rest and recuperate, or just remain idle for very long periods of time, not even stirring to go hunting for food. Precious metals are very good conductors of energy. In the dra dragon's case, the precious metals have the same sort of influence on the elemental aspect of their metabolism that allows them to process raw elemental power into biological, organic chemical power much more efficiently. Dragon wormlings that have early access to a sufficient supply of precious metals and gems to rest on will grow much faster than those that do not, and they need to eat far less than those who do not as well. It's little wonder then that the thing that provides them the best advantage in their early life becomes an object of lifelong obsession for them. Treasure literally makes the dragon feel better. It provides them a deep, unique and innate comfort and support. They don't see gold, platinum, silver and copper as money. They don't see uh, it as a potential wealth to be exchanged for something of equal value because nothing can provide the same value as the precious metals themselves. This is why dragons are loath to part with even a single coin of it. That is why they absolutely believe that no other species is entitled to own it, any of it and they will go out of their way to secure more than enough for themselves and their future offspring. Every last hoard of, dragger, a dra hoard of treasure that is lost to a dragon is lost to the entire species, and they all dislike it when that happens. Now, if your brain is not literally buzzing with new ideas right now, there is more to this growth pivotal uh, first stage of their life, so bear with me. Dragon breath is obviously bi biologically impossible. The amount of acid a black dragon expels in one blast is enormous. It would require a dragon to be constantly eating vast amounts of very specific materials in order to do even that even once, let alone many times in a single day or in just a few minutes. 
This elemental power comes from elsewhere. It is channeled directly from the environment around the dragon. And the wormling hatches, latches onto this power the moment it hatches, it, like it was a source of extremely rich nutrients. The first effect is a dramatic and almost immediate increase in physical size, with the closest equivalent being either a butterfly inflating its wings after emerging from a cocoon, or Bruce Banner transforming into the Incredible Hulk. It's not exactly extra dimensional elemental energy, so you might want to represent this drain on the environment as a dimming of flames, uh, temperature drops or increases, brief nausea and vertigo for people standing around, a roll of thunder with no lightning, vials of acid become like water or vinegar, a pungent smell of ozone. If the wormling is anywhere near precious metals, it will instinctually seek to cover itself with as much of it as possible, burrowing into piles of coins as soon as it's born, regulating this dramatic drawing in of elemental power at the very start of the dragon's life. If they do actually die of old age, they release the elemental power back into the environment, creating local area effects that persist for a very long time. Dragons that pass on this way are more like Jedi, ma Jedi Masters that seem to fade away to nothing, but in reality, they have simply converted to energy and become part of the spirit world of nature itself. So wormlings draw in power, moderate it and convert it more efficiently with precious metals, and fuel their dramatic growth and supernatural breath weapon and physical might with it, also their ability to go long periods of time without food. It also forms the reason they prefer specific environments. These are places that the elemental energy best suits their needs. White dragon wormlings are sleek and aggressive. They have an armor class of 16 and an average of 32 hit points, which is low for a wormling, but then they are ready for aggression the moment they hatch and are quite skilled at avoiding damage or retribution. They are not smart with an average intelligence of 5, wisdom of 10 and charisma of 11, but they are very wary, flying for cover the moment they are, um, they are attacked. They will blast out their freezing breath weapon every chance they get to deter anything from seeking them harm, using the cold to slick surfaces with ice to slow down whatever is chasing them. They tend to sneak up and take what they want, growling and hissing if caught or scolded, running for cover and attacking anything that tries to punish them, much like a truculent cat. They are grumpy, demanding bullies, and love nothing more than chasing down other creatures and killing them. They will see nothing wrong with spooking domestic animals just so they can chase them down and murder them. This is fun for them and they don't care why anything else gets upset by this. Anything that tries to attack them is a fair target for a maximum lethal response. It doesn't matter how much the white wormling provoked them, they take no responsibility for their actions. As you can imagine, they're extremely difficult to train. They are also very proficient at burrowing and will dig themselves a tidy hidey hole and multiple escape routes if they can't find these things around them already. As they are immune to cold, they will instinctually lower the temperature to freezing temperatures in any place that they have to stay for a while to make it more comfortable for themselves. This could kill other creatures that are trapped with them. In this, uh, as they're exposed to these freezing temperatures for too long. So uh, don't chain them up next to uh, guard dogs. Black dragon wormlings are even worse, but considerably, considerably more devious. With an armor class of 17 and an average of 33 point hit points, they're tougher than they look. They're also demonstrably lethal from the moment they hatch, which with the black dragon is very clear right from the first few hours of their life. If they're born in the clutch, they will fight each other uh, and fight their siblings to the point of death. Eventually the parent will sit back and just let this happen. If they hatched away from the nest on their own, they will more likely kill a creature out of curiosity at first, then regularly murder things just for entertainment. With an intelligence of 10, wisdom of 11, and charisma of 13, they're not super smart, but they are at least as smart as a normal human being, and they are capable liars. I had a black dragon wormling murder an elderly woman the moment it hatched, then swiftly learned necromancy and the common tongue in a few hours, began out outright lying to everyone who knew of its existence, and quickly built up a treasure hoard for itself, keeping it completely secret, as it was part of a nightly murder spree across the city it had hatched in. Eventually, it effectively destroyed the city, um, dwelling in this undead infested necropolis it uh, left for itself instead, an uh, overlord of its new domain. Black wormlings are immune to acid and are challenge rating too. They are extremely cruel and merciless and think nothing of leaving pools of acid that anyone can step into by mistake. They will then wait for those who cannot afford to be healed to collapse somewhere due to their injuries and sneak in and murder them later. Green dragon wormlings are pl uh, playing every other creature around them like puppets from the moment they hatch. In the clutch, they will play games of alliance and betrayal with each other, eventually either dominating or murdering or completely uh, being completely under control of their other sibling. 
which who in turn is manipulated by the parent, who uses the dominant sibling to control the rest of the clutch, who of course constantly seek a way to do away with their parent and the dominant sibling to take everything they have for themselves. Due to this constant manipulation, you must never trust anything a green dragon wormling says or does, and always look for the angle or con game the dragon is playing against you. They have an armor class of 17, an average of 38 hit points, an intelligence of 14, which is very high, wisdom of 11, and charisma of 13. They are immune to poison and are a challenge rating 2. They are very good swimmers and can operate fully aquatically. If at all possible, they will establish well-concealed, protected, and difficult to get into bolt holes and safe house lairs for themselves, usually underwater, never revealing to any one creature all of the places they could run to, and not even a quarter of all the con jobs, schemes, and scams that they have on the go at any one time. If that wormling, Green Dragon, seems cute, friendly, and easy to train, it has ex- you exactly where it wants you. Blue dragon wormlings are manipulative manipulative brutes who tend to dominate lesser creatures, so they seek to grow in size and power as quickly as they can and instinctually know that it is better, more useful, to be able able to kill than to actually kill. And as long as the target knows it is the blue dragon wormling's choice not to kill them, and as long as they know that they have to do what the wormling says, or they will get murdered, and then it's all good. As they need to back up these threats quite often at a young age, they have an armor class of 17, an average of 52 hit points, an intelligence of 12, a wisdom of 11, and charisma of 15. They use that high charisma to intimidate more than to charm, but they at least can be trusted more than the green or black wormling. You tend to know exactly where you stand with a blue wormling, as long as you are more useful to them alive than the dead. They're also immune to lightning and are a challenge rating 3. They're also very adept at digging holes and burrow through the ground, storing their wealth for safekeeping and hiding the bodies of their victims fairly deep in hard-to-find grave burrows, which also serve as bolt holes with stored-away snacks. Red Dragon Wormlings are, as you imagine, the toughest, largest, and most physically abusive of the Wormlings. They thrive on physical contests and rough play, which for them consists of fractured spines, broken femurs, and skull fractures for ordinary humanoids, if they're lucky. Raised in a clutch, they will become ever more boastful, mercurial, and aggressive, until at some point, an inevitable fight to the death breaks out between two or more siblings. In the end, only one will grow to adult size and eventually rule over the entire territory. With an armor class of 7 17 and an average of 75 hit points, they are very powerful for such a young dragon, and have a pretty capable intelligence of 12, wisdom of 11, and charisma of 15. They're immune to fire, and are a challenge rating 4. They, though they seem more challenging in person, they're not above cheating in in a fight. As long as they come out on top, it doesn't matter how they got there, and will do some very nasty things given time and preparation, such as challenging a tough humanoid to a fight, then right at the start of it, throwing the detached mauled head of the opponent's wife and children down in front of them, leaping in to a furious assault. Sure, it's a filthy and evil thing to do, but it's also quite effective and just adds to the Wormling's fearsome reputation. Gold Dragon Wormlings are completely different, but they have quite an ego when they are Wormlings. They have an armor class of 17, an average of 60 hit points, an intelligence of 14, wisdom of 11, and charisma of 16. They're immune to fire and are a challenge rating 3. They're uh, smarter than the Red Wormling, but not quite as tough. Instead of directly confronting things immediately, Gold Wormlings will pause to consider all of their options. They take to training extremely well and will often... Find, uh, you often know that pairing up with more experienced being or one that complements their own abilities is the very wise course of action that they will follow 100% of the time. While gold wormlings don't tend to fight without very good reason, they're not shy of adventure and will often travel with adventuring companions in their youth. Silver dragon wormlings are even more adventurous but far less respectful of the worth of other species, particularly when they're younger. It's usual to find a silver wormling raised outside of its clutch and silver dragons uh, it's Sorry, it's unusual to find them raised outside of their clutch, and silver dragons will go to extraordinary lengths to get their offspring back out of the custody of humanoids. With an armor class of 17, an average of 45 hit points, an intelligence of 12, wisdom of 11, and charisma of 15, they're immune to cold and are a challenge rating 2. Don't forget that all metallic wormlings have two breath weapons to choose from, which they're very skilled with. Silvers seek out other metallic dragons, even as wormlings, they will not stay with humanoids for long unless they know that is where other metallic dragons have told them to stay. The silvers also tend to go off on missions all the time, and can vanish for a hundred years on some sort of silver dragon business that they feel no need to explain to anyone else.
Brass Dragon the Wormlings are a great company. They're what I think is the best case scenario as far as humanoids raising hatchlings uh, dragons goes. They have an armor class of 16 and an average of only 16 hit points, much lower than even the White Dragon Wormlings, so they rely on the mutual protection of their friends and companions. Their intelligence of 10, wisdom of 11, and charisma of 13 is pretty good. They're immune to fire and a challenge rating 1. They are curious, love to hear stories, collect interesting objects, trinkets, and artifacts, love to form lifelong friendships with humanoids, and Form close bonds with other metallic dragons. Bronze dragon wormlings are similar to brass dragons but not as gregarious, quite a bit more independent, but still very loyal at, uh, friends and companions, as long as their trust is never betrayed. They have an armor class of 17 and an average of 32 hit points, an intelligence of 12, wisdom of 11, and a charisma of 15. They're immune to lightning and have had a challenge rating of 2. They're just um, all around pretty good at what they decide to do and tend to become fixated on certain areas of the world that they consider to be their territory under their protection and kind of under their control. Copper Dragon Wormlings will talk your ear off and never seem to be short of jokes, pranks and tall tales to delight and amuse everyone. They have an armor class of 16 and an average of 22 hit points, an intelligence of 14, wisdom of 11 and charisma of 13. They are immune to acid and are a challenge rating 1. They have two types of breath weapons, the acid breath or a slowing breath, and they have no natural bite attack as Wormlings, only developing that later on in life in their adult state. Copper dragons and brass dragons will certainly make use of equipment to protect themselves and to bolster their abilities. And gold dragon wormlings uh, go on adventuring and actually quite often acquire magical items themselves. They also design magical items and things and craft them and smith them for themselves and other dragons. That about does it for the dragon wormlings. Uh, never forget that alive or dead, these creatures are highly valuable, and more than uh, the more they're trained and happy to cohabitate with humanoids, the higher the price becomes, and the fantasy world is full of thieves who will certainly try to capture a live wormling dragon, even if they had to bump the current owner off as they see it by use of an uh, alleyway and something like a poison dagger this will be extremely stressful to the wormling who uh, gets used to the idea of certain humanoids in its life and uh, when they learn of this duplicitous duplicitous and somewhat evil aspect of humanoid society uh, particularly in the metallic, metallic dragons case it can be heartbreaking for them just a reminder if you've not subscribed already it's well worth it as i have over 250 monster ecology videos like this one that you can watch at your leisure i hear they make very good listening during the commutes to work please uh, take make a main moment to click the notification bell and uh Give this a thumbs up if you liked it. You should see regular uploads from me every single week. Those who wish to explore the links in the description text under the video, video you'll see links to my Patreon page. We can get access to all the scripts for these videos, which have uh, all the names and locations and stats and things that I just listed off in this video for you, as well as having special access to me, and I'll be able to research things for my patrons if they ask me any questions. It will give me suggestions for making videos like this. Anyone can join the Mighty Gloostick Discord server. Great platform to chat create game groups, uh, run video game chats with people around the world, share dank memes, and discuss all things D&D, link down below, as well as links to merchandise for the channel. I've just got the uh, a brand new design up with a lot of different products that are priced as low as I can go for Christmas, so check that out. Plus Patron Blades, I highly recommend Patron Blades as I use them myself for a mighty smooth shave. As always, thank you very much for listening everybody, and I'll catch you again soon.